this audience here probably already knows this, but this is the kind of exercise where you're really not able to have a conversation because you're working too hard. You're working hard. You're not able to really talk. And um, if you're wearing a heart rate monitor, you know, you're somewhere like 80 percent max heart rate or higher. So that's the kind of exercise that that I'm really going to be focused on mostly for the next part of my talk. If you could pill it up, it'd be the biggest blockbuster anti-aging drug ever. Um, but no one's going to be able to do that because it's doing too many things. One thing that it's doing is it's improving cardiorespiratory fitness. So cardiorespiratory fitness is so important for the way we age. Um, it's measured often by something called VO2 max. That's the maximum amount of oxygen you can take up during maximal exercise. And why is it so important? Well, because it takes, we need to be able to move oxygen throughout our tissues and transport it to, you know, our organs to be able to live, right? And if you think about cardiorespiratory fitness, I mean, it actually, me on this stage talking to you, it takes about 11 about 11 milliliters per kilogram body weight per minute to just talk to you guys, to have a conversation. That's what it takes. To just what you're doing is sitting still and breathing. It takes about three milliliters per kilogram body weight per minute to do, just sit and breathe. To do anything else, it's going to be way more than that, right? And if you're talking about maximal exercise, you're going to get, you know, up much, much higher. But, you know, if you think about like some older adults, you know, some some are really breathy just walking to their car or like just doing just everyday situations where they walk to the house and they're just so breathy. They don't have a good cardiorespiratory fitness. And that's not good because we all are going down and reaching this cliff. We will all get to that cliff as we're aging. And when we get to that cliff, everything becomes a mass, maximal effort. So I talked about the Mac, the BO2 max when you're doing a maximal exercise. That's, well, just sitting and breathing becomes a maximal effort, right? And you don't want that. So what you want is to bank and get your VO2 max as high as you can because you want to be way high up when you're going down the cliff. That way you have a lot longer way to go to get to that cliff. We know from studies that being below normal, so going anywhere, if you're like below normal and going anywhere above that, like is good. So even if you go from below normal to low normal, that's associated with a two-year increase in life expectancy. Um, if you go up to the high where you're going above the normal, that's a five-year increase in life expectancy. And the, some researchers have actually done a calculation and found in a dose-dependent manner for every unit increase in your VO2 max, so that would be for every one milliliter per kilogram per minute in your, in your ability to you know, take in oxygen um, and move it around, that correlates with a 45-day life extension. So you're adding 45 days to your life for every unit increase in your VO2 max. There's a JAMA study that was published uh, not too long ago, a couple of years back, that I really like to talk about because it looked at a variety of different cardiorespiratory fitness in a popu in this this population was actually from the um, veterans, and and found that those those participants with the highest VO2 max had a five year increased life expectancy as the other one compared to people in the lowest. They were actually eighty percent less likely to die from all causes of mortality compared to people in the lowest cardiorespiratory group. But what was also interesting is that if you took those really high VO2 max individuals, so these were the elite people, these were these were like people that were in the top 2%, and compared them to people with a high VO2 max, these are like the top 25%. These are healthy people that are fit. They still had a 20% 20, 20 increase in life expectancy compared to those individuals. So in other words, the conclusion was you there was really no limit to the mortality benefit if you keep increasing your VO2 max. And I just mentioned there was a calculation, right? 45 days for every unit. So there you go. Um, makes sense. But what I really like about this study actually isn't that. It's that what, what was found was um, low cardiorespiratory fitness was actually predicting mort mortality better than some diseases. So in other words, people that had cardiovascular disease, people that have type 2 diabetes or people that smoked, you know, they had the lowest mortality risk. But guess who else did? People that didn't smoke, didn't have type 2 diabetes, didn't have, you know, hypertension or any of these other diseases, but they had a low cardiorespiratory fitness. So in other words, not being physically active is a disease. It needs to be treated like a disease. It is a disease. Um, we don't talk about it like a disease. We talk about like this, this option, like something... Well, no, it's a disease. Not being physically active is a disease. So how do you improve your cardiorespiratory fitness? 
Well, you might think aerobic exercise, that's the best way. Well, yeah, aerobic exercise is definitely one of the, is, is better to, you know, at improving cardiorespiratory fitness than, for example, strength training is. Um, but it turns out that vigorous intensity exercise, really pushing your, your cardiovascular system to the limits and particularly high intensity interval training, where for certain intervals of time, you're really going, you know, pushing that cardiovascular system, you're pushing your respiratory system, your muscular system, and then you're recovering and then pushing it again, right? That seems to be the best, best way at improving cardiorespiratory fitness. And we know that because there've been large studies that have done with, um, large sample sizes with participants that are actually meeting the physical activity guidelines for moderate intensity exercise. So they're doing about two and a half hours a week of moderate intensity physical activity. So, you know, depending on what journal you read, um, the definition of moderate intensity does vary. But generally speaking, you know, we're talking about people that sort of can have a breathy conversation uh, a little bit. You know, they're, they can talk about their breathy while they're, while they're exercising. That would be sort of moderate intensity exercise. About 40% of those individuals can't improve their VO2 max. That's almost like a coin toss. That's almost like half, right? I don't know about you. Like, I don't want to be in the coin toss. Like, I want to definitely improve my VO2 max. So we know that those individuals can improve their VO2 max if they engage in vigorous intensity exercise. And so we're going to talk about um, some of the best ways to improve cardiorespiratory fitness with these HIT protocol, HIT protocols. So pretty much all high intensity, you know, interval training is going to improve your VO2 max. Um, but it seems as though the longer the interval or you're pushing yourself, the more robust the improvement. And that's where the Norwegian 4x4 comes in. So this was something that's been done by the Norwegian ski team. They get on a stationary bike and for four minutes, they go as hard as they can and maintain that intensity for the entire four minutes. Not going to be all out, obviously. It's going to be, you're going to be doing, you know, a pretty hard effort, but you have to maintain it for four minutes. So you have to, to pace yourself. It takes some trial and error to figure out what that, you know, intensity is going to be, but you'll figure it out after a couple of times. So you do that for four minutes and then for, and then you recover for three minutes and then you go back and you do it. It's a four, four times. So you do it four times. That's why it's the four by four. Um, this is the most evidence-based way to really robustly improve cardiorespiratory fitness. Uh, if you haven't gone into a lab and actually had it, your VO2 max empirically measured, um, I'm sure Andy Galpin does it, does it here at Parker, you can actually do an estimate of it. So yeah, your, your wearable device kind of does a little bit of a variation of it. And I don't, it's accurate, accurate, maybe like if you're looking at like, you know, longer parts of data, not like on a, I, I don't know if it's accurate on like a day-to-day -day basis, um, but you can do what's called the 12-minute run test. And that's where you are running for 12 minutes as fast as you can and maintain for that entire 12 minutes. You have to pace yourself and it has to be a flat track, like because the hills will make a difference in how fast you can go. And so you have to have some kind of wearable device that can measure your distance. And essentially, once you get your distance and you can plug in this formula, you can look it up. It's called the Cooper Test. Um, and you can find the formula, and then that's a pretty good estimator of VO2 max. Vigorous intensity exercise, including the Norwegian 4 by 4 we're going to get into to that um, and how it can reduce the aging of the heart. So as we age, our hearts shrink and they get stiffer with, with age. Um, the stiffness, you know, a lot of that comes from glucose, you know, dysregulation, I guess. You know, the longer glucose sits around in our vascular system, it forms something called advanced glycation end products. And those basically damage, you know, the, the they stiffen the myocardium, the pericardium, you know, the collagen that's surrounding our heart. And that kind of makes our heart become stiffer with age. If you think about exercise, what happens, it really brings glucose into the muscles. So exercise is great for getting glucose in and really plays a role in improving the um, flexibility of our hearts. So Ben Levine did this study actually out of Dallas, UT Southwest. Um, he's probably the world's leading expert on exercise physiology. He's an amazing researcher. He wanted to ask this question, can I take, can I take middle-aged adults? So these were 50-year-olds who are basically, they don't have any identifiable, identifiable diseases other than the fact that they're sedentary, so they're not physically active. But they don't have type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease. They don't smoke. You know, they're not, they're not doing any of that stuff. So I want to take these individuals and see if I can improve their, their, their heart aging, structural changes, right? And so he took these individuals 
and put them into two groups. There was the treatment group, and then there was the control group. And the treatment group, this was a two-year study, the treatment group got, you know, pretty intense exercise training protocol. It was progressive. You can't just take someone that's not physically active right out the gate, get them doing the Norwegian 4x4. It's going to be way too hard. So they progressively over six months kind of got to the point where they can then add in, you know, more vigorous intensity exercise. By the end of that six months and the rest, the remaining of the year and a half, they were working out, they were doing exercise for about five hours a week. And that exercise included um, once a week and twice a week at times of the Norwegian 4x4. It also included a lot of, you know, moderate, more to vigorous. So you're talking about like 75% max heart rate. They were doing a lot of that type of cardiovascular training. They were also doing some resistance training as well. The control group was getting like this yoga-ish stretching kind of stuff. Not that yoga isn't good for you. It just isn't going to reverse your aging heart as we're going to learn. So after those two years, those 50-year-olds, if you look at the structure of their heart, the size of their heart, essentially it reversed the aging of their heart by almost by about 20 years. So their hearts looked more like what a 30-year-old's heart looked like in terms of the size and the stiffness just after two years of this intense exercise training protocol. Very astonishing data. I love this study, not only because, you know, it shows that it's never too late to really like make a big difference. I mean, 50-year-olds, right? They were able to do this. But just that if you put in that effort, a 20-year reduction in the structural aging of your heart is huge. It's huge and it's very motivating.